grandson was looking at the pictures and kind of looking around the room with a real perplexed look on his face. And finally he looked to me and he said, in the olden days, what was it like when everything was black and white? <laughs> <laughs> so this poem's called Yellow. Like Howdy Doody and the Musketeers, her childhood is in black and white. Chicago coal dust sprinkled like pepper across snowy lawns. Gray slush and the school, five-story brick in a sea of black top. Up the steps, through the tall door, she cringes at the first bell, has to pee, but the tardy bell is next. Squeal of her rubber boots down cavernous halls, scent of ammonia, chalk dust, and glue. Seated at a desk, bolted to the floor, she's five, a big girl now, trained to hold back, to hold in. Her palm lifts, circles, and then wilts. She's scared of Miss Kofal's face, caked with powder, black eyebrows penciled high above the frown. On the radiator sits a metal crate with 30 miniature milk bottles. She must drink it warm through a paper straw that softens pulpy on your reluctant lips. Hands folded, body wound tight, holding, holding, counting the loud ticks of the regulator clock. Lined up near the front door, she bends her knees, ready to sprint as the clang sets off the explosion of feet and elbows. Teachers shout, but the stampede doesn't slow until they reach the first crossing guard at 85th Street. The endless trudge as one by one the cluster of kids peel off into their own front yards. In her mind, she sees the toilets and is asking, please? But she's holding so tight, no words can pass. She pulls off her mitten and chews the fat of her fist, praying to the liquid God with her mother's kitchen lit up in the distance. Imagined eyes roll behind dark panes. A little cloud escapes her chilled lips. She stands absolutely still as the hot sting seeps down one leg into her sock. Hold it. Hold it. Her legs refuse to obey. They spring apart with a gush and a brittle laugh. Her own voice, the only sound in the empty room, in the empty street. She is wet and shivering, but stares, transfixed by the arc of color the unexpected loveliness, like a giant lemon lollipop, etched 
into black and white snow. When I was a little girl, what I always loved to do was to peek into my mother's jewelry box. Because there were two things in that jewelry box that I always wanted to look at and find the story of. I have those two things here. They were the only two things I really wanted from my mother's jewelry box. One was her braids, lopped off when she was 12. And the other, which you will see in one of the pictures, is the rattle. See the rattlesnake she shot when she was 12. I've heard this story so many times and it's taken me years to find a way to pull it together into a poem. So this is, takes place in, it begins in Hastings on Hudson, near the Hudson where my mother grew up, and then it goes down to Texas, which is where my Grandfather also taught my mother how to drive when she was 12. This is called Doxy, 1937. A spy from behind the privet. You watch your older sister entertain her beau. She holds up plum jam, she bottled herself, scoops a spoonful into his waiting mouth. His dark eyes bulge, he gags and spurts, and you are rolling, clutching your skirts, sniggering at the prank, the cod liver oil spoon. You sprint from her screams, scramble high into the arms of the weeping beach, and long, deaf to the calls of your mother, lost in the empty sky, searching for a glimpse of Amelia and her Lockheed Electra. Knees clutch the bow outstretched arms tilt left, then right, in imaginary glide. One day, you'll get your pilot's license, poke through clouds like your father did in the Great War. You love to rest your cheek against the polished wood of his propeller, each half as tall as you, shipped back from France and placed in the front hall next to the hat rack. When Nanny hollers, mother's given up. You shimmy down, quick, quick smart, for the excursion to town. A maiden voyage to the beauty parlor. Your amber plaits locked off below your ears, now that you are 12. You bring them home in a box, Two fat snakes of hair. Proud of your aviatrix bob, only Nanny sheds a tear for the locks she brushed each evening, counting 100 strokes. <coughs> this summer, you alone will accompany your father with his quick silver eyes and handlebar mustache south on the train to Texas, where he's promised to teach you to drive. Pop's special pet. But you didn't expect Pop's business partners to cram into the roadster. Fish-eyed Pete and Russ, all wrinkles and white beard, fringed in nicotine yellow. On the horizon, heat rises in wavy lines. Gigantic metal birds dip and lift.
bubbling up oil. These are the wells the men have come to inspect. Pop plumps a pillow so you can peer over the dash. From the back, the men advise how to pull out the choke, and the shifts so stiff, Pop has to do that part. On the flat dirt road, each lurch brings snorts of laughter. A joke teaching a girl to drive. Pop slides a butterscotch onto your tongue as you grasp the wheel and stretch to press the pedal with the toe of your Mary Janes. Clattering over ruts, kicking up dust, the wind dances with your cropped hair. Pop hands around his silver flask and the men grow more boisterous. You picture Amelia, ten feet tall on the movie tone screen, climbing into the cockpit. These endless flats would make a perfect runway. You hear the thrust of the un-engine and feel it lift off. But Pop is waving his hands, shouting, pull over, and you pump the clutch and brake spinning out. As the dust settles, Russ thumps your shoulder, blows whiskey breath. Crazy girl, could have rolled us. But Pop beams, a born race car driver. The men are about to set off on foot when you spot a rattlesnake coiled on a rock. Watch out! Show them how to shoot. Pop hands over his pistol, but you've only ever shot clay pigeons. Sepia and black scales glisten in the sun. The men glare at your trembling grip on the gun. Squinting, you cock it. Aim for the head and squeeze. Eyelids tremble, eardrums quake, his muscled form rears up and shrinks. Something shifts in your skull like sand sinking to your toes and spilling out. Russ dangles the snake, tries to drape it, a trophy around your neck, but you push him away. Wincing, you crawl into the back seat. The men complete their business. Pop takes the wheel. Pete has snapped the rattle off the tail and slips it into your palm. Firm as a fingernail, woven like a chain, you shake this brittle, beautiful thing. And if there is a tear, you never let them see it. Back at the lodge, the guests are hunched around the wireless. Amelia Earhart has disappeared somewhere near New Guinea.